I want to share a story with you about something I have enjoyed for so many years and it was something that I wanted to pass on to my kids and that is my joy of cycling. And so we have lived for many years now very close to the American River Parkway and for any of you who are familiar with the American River Parkway, it is this beautiful paved path that is over 30 miles in one direction and it meanders along the American River. You can start in Old West Sac and you can ride all the way out to Folsom. And there's just, it's just this beautiful gym in the middle of the city such that you don't even realize you're in the city. And so it's just this wonderful, peaceful place to, to have some quiet time, to listen to the water, see some of nature's wildlife. You're likely to see the turkeys running along the trail. You might see some deer. You might even see an occasional coyote uh, on the bike trail. And so in my love of, of the bike trail and, and being out in nature, one of the things that I always uh, looked forward to when my kids were young was the day that they would be old enough to ride a bike and get on the bike trail and go for a ride on the American River Parkway. But the American River Parkway, it's a busy place. And so before we would get on the bike trail, I would remind the kids, I'm going to lead and I want you guys to stay close to me. All right. I want you to not get too spread out. We're going to go at a good pace that hopefully is comfortable. If I get too far ahead, let me know. I'll slow down. And there's some rules that I want you to follow. So there's some things that we might have some people who are walking our direction on the side. So if I say uh, like runner up, or walker up. That means we've got a runner or walking walker coming toward us. And so we want to just kind of move over a little bit so we give them space and, and, and everybody's good. And I may even let you know that as we get close to a hill that you might need to get ready to get some speed up so you can get up that hill or change gears so it's easier for you so you don't have to get off the bike and push it up the hill or you're letting them know, hey, we're going to go around the turn. And when we go around this turn, we're going to go downhill. So get ready to, you know, just go as fast as you feel comfortable going. So all these things to try to help them have this safe experience following me on, on the bike trail and have this wonderful experience just being out in nature. But it was important for me to let them know some certain things so that they had a good experience. And the reason I could share those things with them is because I knew what the experience was like, what we were going to encounter, what we would, uh, what the trail ahead of us looked like. And even maybe there might be a branch in the, in the road. So I might even say, okay, we've got, you know, we need to move over to the left so we don't run over the branch and wreck. So all these things, which leads us to our passage today and the sermon title, Follow the Master. And I want to start um, in Matthew 10, 24. But do know, this section of Scripture from Matthew 10, 24 through 39 is full of rich content. And as background, Jesus is talking to His disciples. He is preparing them for what is to come as followers of him. And so we start in verse 24 of Matthew 10 and reading from the NIV. And Jesus tells his disciples, he says, The student is not above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. Jesus very clearly states the position of the student or in this case of the disciples, or the servant in relation to the teacher or the master. You are not to consider yourself above either 
person, the teacher or the master. And obviously in this context, he's referring to himself. That we are not to consider ourselves greater than Jesus as the teacher or the master. And it's interesting here that Christ is both teacher and master. He's not one, but he is both. And that's quite significant because this makes each of us not only his students, but also his servant if we follow him. And so as a student or a servant, we are to follow the instructions. Just like I was giving instructions to the kids as we were on the bike trail of the teacher, the master, and not going and doing what we think is best or right or the right way of doing something. So that's important. The student is not above the teacher and the servant is not above the master. Continuing on in Matthew 10, 25, he says this, and we're going to read the first half of it. It says, it is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. This is the part where it's about imitating the master. And I love that Jesus says this as a start of the passage. It is enough. You don't need more. You don't need less. It is enough. I am enough. Imitate me to be like the master or the teacher. It made me think of, uh, I've been kind of a little bit obsessed with watching this Bruce Lee series. And for those who don't know who Bruce Lee is, he was this martial artist back in the 60s and 70s. And one of the things that if you were to take martial arts, there is an instructor, maybe the master, the sensei, or the shifu. And the students learn from the master by following the things the master does. So if the master moves this way with their left hand, the students move and they follow that. And as they learn to follow his instruction or her instruction, they begin to become better. They go from different belt classes. And so it's no different as we follow Jesus, our teacher and our master, we become better followers of what he has for us. So when I think about people who imitate us, I think back to a moment when my son Kyle was in kindergarten, all of six years old, and at the end of the school year, they had all the kindergarten students do a, um, I guess, a, a show, so to speak, of what do you want to be when you grow up? And it was this beautiful thing. We had uh, kids in like football gear, so like an athlete. We, I remember a cheerleader. We had a doctor, a fireman, kind of the normal stuff. And my son, Kyle, comes up on stage, and you can show the picture. And he is, he's, he's dressed up. Look at him. He looks like he's ready to, to go to work, right? He's ready to be in corporate America. Look at that. Well, uh, so you know, if you haven't already guessed, he is wearing my clothes <laughs> from top to bottom. My shoes, my pants, my belt. He has my watch on and he has my shirt. He was very insistent that he needed to wear my clothes because what my son wanted to be when he grew up was a dad. And that just brought tears to my eyes at that moment that my son, at age six, wanted to be like me. He wanted to imitate me. And as I was thinking about this message, the thought crossed my mind is, while that made me feel extremely 
grateful. It filled my heart. My greater desire is that he would put on Jesus' robes and follow him. Imitate the master. We move into another section, though, as a way of encouragement to the follower about do not be afraid. And so as he's speaking to his disciples, Jesus is going to tell his disciples three things not to be afraid of as, as followers, and he's going to provide encouragement to each of them, and hopefully to you and I. And the first do not be afraid is around what the world calls us. And so we see in Matthew 10 and verse 25 in the second half, it says this, If the head of the house has been called Belzebul, how much more the members of his household... Jesus, our master, had been called basically Satan by the religious leaders, particularly on a couple of occasions when he cast out demons. Basically, Jesus is telling his disciples, he's telling us, if the world hates me, the world will hate you. But he continues on in verse 26. But he says, so do not be afraid of them. For there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. The truth will be revealed about those who twist and lie about who they say Jesus is and what they say we are as followers. So... Don't be afraid. The second thing that Jesus tells us is don't be afraid of the things Jesus speaks and shares with us. And in verse 27, he says this, What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. This is the complete opposite of what normally occurs. When we think about it, the things that are shared in the dark are usually attempted to stay in the dark and hidden. Our intent is not to let those things be made known. Unlike whatever Jesus shares in the dark, he says, share that. Make it known. Don't hide what I have told you. And the things that are whispered, typically, when those are whispered, we don't want others to hear. We don't want them to know what was shared. Again, Jesus tells us to make what he whispers known as widely as we can. I want you to go onto the rooftop and proclaim what I've shared with you. There's no need to hide what I've shared, whether in the dark or whispered. The things in this world that are shared in the dark, that are whispered, are things which the world wants to have hidden or kept quiet, but not so with Jesus. Proclaim them when Jesus shares it. So no matter when or how Jesus shares something with us, there is never a need to be quiet about what he has shared. Do not be afraid. The third thing, and this is a tough one. I can only imagine what Jesus is thinking as he's sharing this with his disciples. But he says, do not be afraid that man can kill you. And he says this in verse 28, and he says, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body and hell. 
don't be afraid of death. Man cannot kill the soul. Only God can destroy both. And while we're not facing that kind of a situation, we have brothers and sisters all around the world that are not afraid to die for following Christ. And someday, and in some future time, that may be us. And I say, do not be afraid. Continue to follow the Master. I love the encouragement that he shares, though, in these next three verses, starting in verse 29. Jesus says to his disciples, he says, not two sparrows, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Our soul is precious. And we are worth so much to the Father. Do not be afraid. Kind of the third part of this passage is this, is in 30, verses 32 and 33. And let's look at this. It's about acknowledging the Master. And it says in verse 32, Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. So Jesus acknowledges us to the Father when we acknowledge Jesus. And I think of it like this. Jesus coming before God and saying, God, I want you to meet Clyde. God, I want you to meet Joe. God, I want you to meet Linda. God, I want you to meet Peter. Any one of us. He brings us before the Father and says, this is my friend. This is my follower. But he makes a very strong statement in verse 33, though. He doesn't mince words. He says in verse 33, But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. So if you or I decide to turn our back on Jesus and no longer follow Him before others, then know that you or I will be disowned or disinherited before the Father. Let's look at the next part. Be worthy of the Master's purpose. And we move into verse 34 and it says this. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Why would Jesus say he did not come to bring peace, but a sword? Isn't he called the Prince of Peace? He is the Prince of Peace. But Jesus is fighting a spiritual enemy. Who does not want the world to know who He is, nor the Father or the Holy Spirit? And so as followers, Jesus is letting us know that the world is going to fight against us. So, I ask you this question. Are we also joining Jesus in revealing the Godhead? I hope that we are, and I include myself. Because the world will see you as a threat to what they think is good. Because to follow Jesus is to give up the ways of this world. You mean I can't follow my own selfish desires? No. I can't cheat, lie, deceive, scheme, covet, lust? No, I can't. I can't worship the philosophies of other religions? No. I can't follow the ideologies of the culture that wants to deny there is a God? No.
there is a spiritual battle that's going on. And the result looks like this when we follow Jesus, or could look like this. Thankfully for, I think, many of us, it's not this, but it is for those who do follow Jesus. As we look in Matthew 10, verses 34 through 36, and it says this, For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Those closest to you may be against you. Yet despite the potential outcome of those within our family, our household turning against us, a follower of Christ doesn't let that hatred against them or her to love Christ less or to desire those who were once close to us to discover who Jesus is. I know many of us don't experience that or maybe have not experienced that. But I want to share a brief story out of a book that I've been reading called When Faith is Forbidden. It's by Todd Nettleton. It's produced by the Voice of the Martyrs. And I want to read a, a little bit of a story about Ali. Ali was a Muslim in China, which you don't typically think of, but there are Muslims in China. And he became a Christ follower. And so I want to just read some of his story. So he says, I began to study the Bible. Ali's father was a leader of the local mosque. His brother had gone away to study Islam under the Taliban in Afghanistan. This was not a family that would easily accept one of its members showing interest in Christianity. And they didn't. When they discovered Ali was reading the Bible, they burned the book. Don't ever read that book again, they told him. It's all wrong. It's all been changed. The next day was the weekly day of prayer. As Ali's family prepared to go to the mosque, Ali announced that he would not be going with them. From that moment on, his family opposed him in every way. Soon after, he was kicked out of the family home. I am no longer your father, his father told him, and you should never come home again. But the family wasn't satisfied just to make Ali homeless. His father also visited his school, loudly complaining that staff clearly weren't monitoring their students. Because if they were doing their jobs, his son wouldn't have become a Christian. So fearing arrest, Ali dropped out of school and left the area. He moved to a place where he had relatives. But the relatives had been told by Ali's father he was no longer a Muslim. And they turned him away. Former friends also refused to welcome him or help him in any way. Sleeping on the streets or wherever he could, Ali soon became sick. He ended up in the hospital, and normally in China, family members, in China, family members bring food to the patient, but Ali's family had deserted him. And it goes on, it just talks about the miracle of the provision that God provided to him despite all of those challenges. And it kind of concludes with Ali saying this. He says, God says he loves all the people, Ali explained. And I love that verse because I love my people too. Ali experienced a house that was set against him. Let's move on. Matthew 10, verse 37. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. The point is, love Jesus more than any other. Love Jesus more than any other. Verse 38. Who does, whoever does not take up their cross and follow me 
is not worthy of me. Jesus is letting his disciples know, endure the suffering which is going to come by following me. It was a hard road for the apostles. Many of us didn't have it and won't suffer like the apostles did. But know that following the master may mean suffering. Endure. Bear your cross and follow him. And lastly, as we get close to wrapping up, we look at and see what the master provides to us to, when we follow him. And it says in verse 39, whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. I like uh, what Barnes said on, in the book Notes on the Bible. He says this, He that is anxious to save his temporal life or his comfort and security here shall lose eternal life or shall fail of heaven. He that is willing to risk or lose his comfort and life here for my sake, Jesus shall find life everlasting or shall be saved. This is the difference between eternal life and the life now. Following Jesus offers us an eternal relationship with him. Something so much greater than trying to enjoy the life the world offers. So let us be great followers for Jesus as our teacher and master has shown us the way. Unafraid of where we are led or what he has us to proclaim, knowing we are cared for and watched over by the Father, always acknowledging who leads us and never denying that we follow Christ. Loving Christ more than any other. And turning away from the, what the world offers so that we may enjoy eternity with Christ. Follow the Master. Let's pray. Heavenly God, the words of your Son, Jesus, to his disciples or words of encouragement for a difficult road that they would face. And yet, everyone who took up their cross, all of them except for Judas, followed you to the end, despite the hardships. And they were all the greater for it, Father. All the greater for it. I pray that each of us as disciples will follow you just as well as the disciples did so many years ago, Father. Let us be encouraged. Let us not be afraid. Let us bear your cross, Father. Let us love you above everything else. I pray that this speaks to our heart and our soul. Let us proclaim your wonderful eternity and what you have done for us in your provision to those around us, Father, whether they're open to hearing or not, let us be led as you lead us and let us follow you all the way to the end. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's say our benediction. May the love of the Father, the tenderness of the Son, and the presence of the Spirit gladden your heart and bring peace to your soul this day and all days. Amen.